Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to see all of you this evening. I feel really short here for some reason today, too. I don't know, I don't know why. I think I'm getting shorter every year. Um, I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum. I, it's so good to see all of you, many familiar faces, some brand new faces. If this is your first time visiting the Athenaeum and you enjoy what you see and what you hear tonight, I invite you to learn more. I invite you to become a member of our community. Uh, we are a group of people of all ages who love to learn. We care about art and history, about literature, about music, about Philadelphia. I think we can say anybody, everybody in this room is passionate about Philadelphia. Um, and, and we love the opportunity to come together, to learn together, to converse together, to imagine our world together. And so I invite you to be a part of who we are. I am excited about tonight's program. Um, as an historian, I like it when I get my little history nerd side fed. Um, tonight's speaker, Richard Cohen, asks the questions that I know I ask a lot, probably many of you ask. Who gets to tell our stories? Who writes history? Who determines what we understand as history? How is that shaped over time? Richard Cohen is a, a delightful individual. It was a, been a pleasure to meet him, and he is a, a well-known author. He's been the author of By the Sword, which is a history of sword play. Keep these all in mind, because I'm going to encourage you to buy tonight's book, but there are other books that he has written you might want to look into. The holidays are coming, birthdays, people graduating from college. There's always a reason to find a book, and Richard Cohen might have a book that would fit the bill for you or someone you love. So By the Sword, which is a history of sword play, Chasing the Sun, which is a history of our star, and How to Write Like Tolstoy, a journey into the minds of our greatest writers. Richard has been the tour expert for the New York Times tour of the World War I battlefields of France, France and Belgium. He's a former publishing, publishing director in, uh, in England and the founder of Richard Cohen Books, as well as the former director of the Cheltenham Festival of Literature. I said that wrong. I said it the way we say Cheltenham here, not in England. I'm sorry, I put the H in. He has also edited books by many award-winning authors like John Le Carre and Madeleine Albright and Vanessa Redgrave. Um, he's been a writer in residence at the New York Public Library's Frederick Lewis Allen Room and for seven years was visiting professor in creative writing at the University of Kingston upon Thames. He's written for many of the U United Kingdom's newspapers as well as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And he's also a five-time UK National Sabre Champion and was selected for the British, British Olympic fencing team in 1972, 1976, 1980, and 1984. So there's a lot about Richard Cohen. I think he might be one of those people you put on your list, you know, when they ask you if you could have dinner with five people. But you'd have to also include his lovely wife, wife, Kathy Robbins, who is a literary agent. Together they are in New York City, and she is with us here tonight also. Richard will give us a talk, and then we'll be open for Q&A. After that, I am going to be his bodyguard and escort him back to the book table, where you can come and buy a book and get it signed by him and ask him any questions you want. So. Um, look forward to that after this time. But right now, I invite you to join me in warmly welcoming Richard Cohen to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Um, now, you may wonder why I brought my wife to Philadelphia. Well, there are lots of um, reasons, but the principal one tonight is so she can stand up and holler at me if I go over half an hour talking to her. Um, but it's also because um, we both wanted to be in Philadelphia. I, I've only been here um, once before, and it is an amazing place, and goodness, full of history. And thinking just of the people who were brought up here or connected with Philadelphia, whether it's 
var Mead och, och Chomsky och Sonnen Guggenheim och Will Chamberlain och um, uh, Kobe Bryant och uh, The Barrymores, W.C. Fields, Grace Kelly, Paul Robeson, um, The Mayflower Madame, um, Benjamin Net Netanyahu, not that they're connected. Um, it's really, well, you know all of them, but um, I don't, and it's an extraordinary list, rather intimidating. Um, and they and the city encompass so much history, um, and there is so much history which, in its own way, is intimidating. Um, how do we make sense of it all? How do we make sense of the past? And I suppose I'd begin by saying the past is two things. It's both everything that's in the past. And then history is what people who interpret it or try to capture history tell us um, through books or cinema or art or whatever um, means it might be. So it's in that second sense that history comes down to us as a filter, somebody else's interpretation. And with that um, comes the fact that just about every historian that I write about has their own agenda. Um, they have um, their version of how they think their slice of the past has been. Um, they may try to be objective, but then being objective is an agenda too. And um, some of you may have seen um, the Tom Stoppard play Night and Day, and there are two journalists talking about the profession of being journalists. And one of them is saying, um, well, I'm, I, I do try to be objective, you know, we're just collectors of fact. And his companion says, yeah, 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 but are you objective for or objective against? <laughs> um, and the other thing to remember um, in your reading and judging is some of the best histories that come down to us are highly prejudiced accounts. Um, you need to balance that, but some of the passion of a person's agenda is what makes a work of history remarkable. And um, I thought I'd just take a couple of instances, um, Voltaire and Gibbon, because they both, um, although Voltaire was over 40 years um, Gibbon's senior, I mean they met once or twice, um, they both had a passion to free writing about the past from the clutch, the control that um, the Christian churches had over the writing of history, and indeed the writing of just about everything else. I mean, Voltaire is a pretty incredible figure. I mean, he was born in 1694, um, and during his lifetime, he wrote two, uh, 200 books. How did he manage it? Well, apart from anything else, he consumed an average of 50 cups of coffee every single day. <laughs> he didn't start writing until 1719 um, uh, by a biography of Charles XII of Sweden. Um, I don't particularly say you should rush to that, it's the first thing he wrote, but it's still remarkable. And he then fell in love with a married woman, Madame de Châtelet, who in her own right um, was a remarkable mathematician and physicist. And um, he used to go down and stay at her grand manor. And um, her husband used to leave them to it here at his uh, set of rooms in the opposite part of the, of the, uh, of the manor. Um, and she really despised history and history writing anyway, um, had a contempt for it. In fact, on one occasion, she purloined, kidnapped one of his scripts and hid it. And it didn't get published until he'd found, found the hiding place. Um, but he, um, therefore, thinking in terms of how history got written, decided he is really going to write history, indeed, the history of the world, just to show his lover um, that history could be readable when it's he who is the author. Um, and you know, the Holy Roman Empire. He wrote that it was neither holy nor Roman, nor is it an empire. Um, and so, in that sense, he really is a kind of companion to Edward Gibbon. And I also suppose that um, the history of the climb and fall of the Roman Empire is the single most uh, famous work of history, per se. Um, put it like that, because you 
um, it could include the Bible in that. Um, and the first volume of that history came out in 1776, which was no accident, because one of his purposes was to advise, to warn the British government that they shouldn't make the same mistakes as um, the Roman rulers, particularly in how they handled um, this, the colonies they had in the Americas. Um, and obviously he did get sufficiently taken notice of, even though his book was a huge bestseller. Well, anyway, um, he turned Catholic, he went up to Oxford at the age of 16, didn't think much of the teaching there, and he became a Roman Catholic, which was a total no-no at that time in Britain. Um, and he had to leave the university because he was a Catholic. And his father was furious with him and packed him off to Switzerland, to Lausanne, where, age 21, he fell in love, hopelessly, completely, with a young Swiss girl called Suzanne Churchill. And when I say hopelessly and completely, he would note down how many hours, to the minute, to the second, in between his seeing her and the next time he saw her. And he'd go around, stop people in the lanes of Lausanne, and with a dagger to their throats, force people who might not even know Suzanne to say how beautiful she was. <laughs> anyway, his father ordered him back to Britain, um, made sure that they stayed friends, but nothing more than that. And so he started to write. He was born in 1737. And one of the things, talking about agendas, agendas, in, it can be you write history out of love, like Voltaire, at least in one way, um, out of religious conviction, out of patriotism, out of rivalry, out of patronage, or maybe the main, the main reason of all, to get some money. Um, um, there are a myriad reasons. History is propaganda for all kinds of convictions. Well, one of the problems with um, Gibbon was he was extraordinarily ugly. I don't know whether that's non-woke thing to say, but he was four foot eight, he was corpulent, had ginger hair, which he tied on a knot on the back of his head. Um, and this corpulence, um, well, he was invited to Paris, to the main salon of the time, um, where uh, Madame Dufont reigned supreme, and she had lost her sight at the age of 57. And she used to get um, supposed celebrity visitors to come and be introduced to her. And since she couldn't see what they were like, she asked to be able to feel their face. And Gibbon presented his face with his puffy cheeks and little O of a mouth. She thought that he was presenting his bare bottom. <laughs> he, he, he was not invited again. Um, but that was not all. I'm going to read you just a paragraph about the life he had to live. His face wasn't the end of it. Virginia Woolf is merciless. The body in Gibbon's case was ridiculous, prodigiously fat, enormously top-heavy, precariously balanced upon little feet upon which he spun round with astonishing alacrity. Forced to leave school because of ill health, the young Gibbon endured fevers and lethargies a fistula in one of his eyes, a tendency to consumption, contraction of the nerves, and a variety of other nameless disorders, even a bite from a rabid dog. Early in adult life, he developed gout, the unwalkable disease, as Hippocrates had termed it. An epoch where close-fitting clothes were the fashion for men. During his time in the militia, he actually served and rather enjoyed it as a soldier. Gibbon developed a hydrocele, a swelling in his left testicle, and for the rest of his life suffered from a distended scrotum, causing him embarrassment and pain in once turned septic, and required constant lancing to remove excess fluid, sometimes as much as four quarts. His proposal of marriage late in life to one Lady Elizabeth Foster was not only met with her helpless laughter, but when she begged him to rise, he was unable to do so, and two stout Swiss helpers had to pull him to his feet. Well, if you had to live inside that body, is it surprising that you should write with such glee, such wonderful, painful irony of one of the most hedonistic societies 
we've ever known. Um, his agenda was very marked, if you know about his life, very obvious. Um, it does raise a question of who gives us our history. We think now, you know, of the world, the world of academia, professors of history and so on. But what I'm trying to do in my book isn't to write an anti-academic book, but to show that most of what we all know of as the past actually comes from people who weren't attached to universities, weren't professional historians in any way. Um, that's why I mentioned the Bible. The history in the Bible, um, the Bible contains a huge amount of history, but it is first and foremost a work of propaganda. I don't belittle it, but I am looking fairly squarely about what it is. Any book that says it was partly the first five books written by Moses, including the description of the death of Moses, does need to be looked at carefully. <laughs> I've also included journalists who write the first draft of history. I've also included novelists um, and dramatists. And I have a chapter devoted to Shakespeare, who after all, in writing about Richard III, Julius Caesar, uh, Cleopatra, Richard II, has probably formed um, our sense of those English monarchs more than any other writer or any other person who's tried to tell us um, what they were like. Um, half his 37 or 38, depending on what you argue, his plays um, are rooted in history, but they're also emphatically works of propaganda. Um, none of his plays took place in London, none of them took place in his own time, but through those plays, he championed and propagandized the Tudor cause. Um, now, at that time, people's entertainment, people's sense of news, people's sense of the past, came from sermons, um, town criers, um, religious plays, and plays being put on, particularly in London. In London, 2,000 people um, would go a day to play as put on, paying 1p if they were hoi polloi, 4p if they were gentlemen. Um, and the demand for new players was extraordinary. Theatres were put on five different plays every week. Um, in Simon Sharma's view, history became the country's new theology. So when you think of historians in the sense of who, through their filter, have given us our understanding of the past. I rate Shakespeare one of the chief amongst them. Um, now, following on from that, you have the figure of Sir Walter Scott, who really, although you might fairly say there were people before him, he um, utterly changed what fiction writers could give um, in terms of understanding the past. He was the first great historical novelist. I mean, he began as a, as a lawyer, um, but then when he turned to writing, he was born in 1814, um, in 15 years he wrote 25 novels, the Waverley novels, Ivanhoe, and Quentin Durward, I mean, an extraordinary list, which we know as much in film as we do the books themselves, as well as seven short stories, five plays. He's an extraordinary figure. But one of his main, his agenda, was to describe Scotland in a way that Scottish history could hold its head up proudly. So, um, he was a remarkable man. Byron wrote of him, what a wonderful person, I'd like to get drunk with him. <laughs> but he invented, you know, the tartan kilt, his invention. He didn't invent bagpipes, they'd been invented in ancient Egypt, but certainly as a Scottish um, piece of culture, totally um, Scott's invention. And the success of his books, the extraordinary success of his books, Jane Austen said, because Scott had begun as a poet before, uh, alongside his legal career, Jane Austen said, it's not fair, leave us alone, stick to, what you, stick to your poetry. Um, in fact, he realised Byron was writing poetry rather better than he, which was one reason he turned to fiction. Um, but um, following um, Scott's success, let alone what it did in terms of inspiring fielding and the whole tradition 
of British and American historical novelists. You had the Prometheus Stasi, the, uh, the betrothed by Manzoni in Italy. You had Pushkin writing historical novels in Russia. Um, in Germany, you had Before the Storm by Theodore Fontaine. In Spain, Benito Gales, who wrote 46 historical novels. He transformed what writers could do in telling the past or using the past for their stories. And so on through the years, I'm sure you've all read any number of historical novels, on to Hilary Mantel, um, who um, again transformed our view of Oliver, Oliver Cromwell and Thomas More. And I asked her, because I was lucky enough to get to know her a bit, um, what prompted her to choose him. And she said, well, I went in the early 1960s to see the play A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt. And that so annoyed me, Thomas More, the saint, the goody-goody you would certainly not want to have that dinner with, and Cromwell, the absolute villain, that I decided to try to put matters to rights. And she has. It may yet, the pendulum may swing, but for the foreseeable future, Thomas Cromwell is Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell, because the right novel written by a talented love writer can change the way we see the past. Um, in fact, novelists used to call themselves um, historians because it gave them a special authority. So when did the professional historian, so to speak, arrive? And it's not as if when the writing of history began, people say um, preeminently Herodotus, the so-called father of history, also called the father of lies, um, began. But he was a sea captain and traveller. Thucydides was um, a sect general, and both of them outsiders. Now, history, the writing of history, isn't a necessary development, but um, certain discoveries are requisite if a society is to advance and having a sense of the past is one of them. So, and don't be scared about this, but I do try to develop the way history writing developed. Um, I don't mean use the word historiography at all in the book, I think, except once, which is a rather good quotation. Um, but it's actually fascinating. Um, and it wasn't until the great German historian, uh, Leopold von Ranke, um, arrived. He was born in 1795, so he's very much um, a 19th century figure, um, that um, he determined that people who wrote history, apart from anything else, should be respected and should have some kind of career structure. Um, and at that time, as the 19th century rolled on, um, and the words science and scientists, those words became invented, um, he realized that scientists got good university posts. They had good careers. So how could he make sure that people who wrote history were respected? Well, he was based nearly his whole life in Berlin. And he introduced into um, his teaching, his writing, certain ideas which we now take for granted. Um, seminars, tutorials, the idea of the doctorate, um, um, using primary sources as a given for any proper, proper piece of historical research. And he became so preeminent, not only did his pupils go to other universities, certainly in Germany, but areas beyond, to head their faculties. But it was just presumed that just as in the 19th century, you'd go to Paris to find out the best in medical research, so you'd go to Berlin if you wanted to be a really good historian. And even so, it took a long time for his ideas to gain proper um, credence. Um, it wasn't until the 1860s um, that doctorates um, were first awarded in America. Um, John Hopkins University was the first in 1861. So it was a battle. But really from that point onwards, from von Renke's time onwards, you get the von if you're respected, so he, at least knew he succeeded in that. Um, that being a professional historian meant anything. Um, and um, I suppose one of the other things I tried to say in my book is for a lot of the time, 
Um, despite the fact that I can name any number of historians, particularly people alive today, because my book goes, well, from pre herodotus right through to the television age, to Simon Sharma and Nigel uh, and, um, uh, Mary Beard. Uh, I haven't even mentioned women as historians, which is a whole chapter in the book. Um, um, a lot of modern history, in order to get, you know, your tenure or your promotion, whatever it is, centers on a very small area of history. And a lot of the time, there's a particular academic voice which mars historical writing. And one of the things that Simon Sharma goes on about at great and, I think, convincing length is it's crucial to capture, to recapture, um, to broadcast the importance of the narrative arts in history, if you like, taking on some of the arts of the novelist. Um, so that there is a danger um, in the academic race to be drawn away from the most readable historical accounts. Um, and again, that's one of the things which I can thump, thump my chest or hand on, whatever. Um, but I suppose the chapter that, I don't know whether it encapsulates the main theme of the book, but certainly one I feel quite passionate about, is a chapter called Bad History. Um, and, um, well, since the book was published in November last year, um, Vladimir Putin said that he was going to have school university te historical textbooks rewritten in order that they could properly show the glories of the Russian past. The same month, President Xi of China said exactly the same thing. And no wonder um, Goethe said that patriotism corrupts history. Um, they reckoned that the glories of their past were what matters. Mind you, it helped that Putin, um, his government, owns the main printing press in Moscow. And it was that press that was given um, the commission to reprint new versions of Putin's versions of history. Um, but um, I don't have to go, I mean, the actual chapter deals with Putin before the last four years of Putin's rule. It goes back to what he first did um, to textbook publishing. It also goes to how Japan hasn't come to terms with its past, particularly its past from 1937 to 1945, and how when MacArthur was in controlling Japan, um, the Japanese people were spared no detail about what, Je what the Japanese had done in terms of the rape of that king, comfort women, crazy phrase, um, biological warfare, and so on. And in the years since then, there's been this retreat from that full account. And still, Japan's government will not face um, what its true history has been. Um, there's a French historian called Ernest Rinan, you may know, who said, forgetfulness is essential in the creation of a nation. But look what's happening now in America. Um, you've got the 1619 project, which, however important it is, is certainly not the whole story. And then Trump commissioning the 1776 commission. So you've got a country riven in its understanding of its own past. And it's not just that America's past is a political ball. Um, 37 states in America no longer have history as part of their basic syllabus in schools, which is extraordinary. And it really leads me to a kind of conclusion that history, the way I've been talking about it, is in crisis um, in this way. Um, and it's up to us to make sure that, as it were, the right side wins in the sense of a respect for truth and its importance wins. But it's not an easy position to defend. Um, and you know, every newspaper every day, you can find examples of what I'm talking about. But having said all these things about history and historians, who is the perfect historian? I know that was on the tip of your tongue to ask. Well, I'm going to talk, I'm going to quote, just to wrap things up, an American historian. He didn't come, I'm afraid, from Philadelphia. I mean, he came from Boston, but you can't have everything. <laughs> um, he he um, 
was a 19th century figure again. He was born in 1796. And like his father and his grandfather before him, he went to Harvard. And he was leaving the refectory one day when there was a rumpus behind him. And he turned and somebody threw a crust of bread across the room. Must be a pretty hard crust. Hit his eye, knocked him down, slight concussion. He woke up the next day blind in that eye. Within, I think, two weeks, he also had inherited on his mother's side a certain kind of rheumatism which affected his remaining good eye. So that for the rest of his life, from student days onwards, he was 95% blind. And yet he wanted, went on to write 11 books, um, foremost amongst them, The Conquest of Peru, and even better, The Conquest of Mexico, two of the most colourful civilizations ever known. Not being able to read any of the source material, he used to hire his family was fairly well off, recent Harvard graduates to read material to him. And he had a phenomenal, phenomenal memory. He can um, uh, remember up to 60 pages a day. But anyway, um, in 1829, he was asked to review Washington Irving's Conquest of Canada. And he considered the question of what a historian should ideally be. And this is the way he concluded. He must be strictly impartial, a lover of truth under all circumstances, and ready to declare it at all hazards. He must be deeply conversant with what, whatever may bring into relief the character of the people he is depicting, not merely with their laws, constitution, general resources, and all the other more visible parts of the machinery of government, but with the nicer moral and social relations, the informing spirit which gives life to the whole. He wasn't done yet, so be patient. He must be conscientious in his attention to geography, chronology, etc., and the inaccuracy which has been fatal to more than one good philosophical history. And mixed up with all these drier details, he must display the various powers of the novelist or dramatist, throwing his characters into suitable lights and shades, disposing his scenes so as to awaken and maintain an unflagging interest, and diffusing over the whole that finished style without which his work will only become a magazine of materials. He must be, in short, there is no end to what a perfect historian must be and do. It's hardly necessary to add that such a monster never did and never will exist. Thank you. So, thank you for being patient, but it's now questions. Anyone? Sun to science, this audience I know is full of thoughts. How does Peter know what's true? How do you know what is true? By reading as much as possible and talking to people whose opinion you respect as much as possible. There's no Set special answer written in stone somewhere. It's you forming your own judgment when you feel you've made some effort to be properly informed. As simple and as difficult as that. About the You think they've got some special authority? Do you know as recently, I suppose it's as recently as 1860, there were textbooks being published in um, North Carolina, I think, that were still um, putting across the view of the American Civil War that the South were unjustly treated and the Civil War was not to do with slavery. Um, textbooks now, let's take a more innocent example, uh, or less um, argument-laden example, um, how was Stonehenge built and why? In the last three years, despite what textbooks have said, there have been great revelations about who did the building and their purpose. So our understanding of history, i.e. what we think is the truth, the fuller truth, if not the ultimate truth, is changing or should be changing all the time. Thank you. If we cannot or won't learn from history, what is its significance other than for entertainment purposes? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I hope one of the main reasons one reads anything is for entertainment purposes. Um, and um, I, I found my, she's in her early 30s now, my daughter who came to stay with us in, in January, she lives in Manchester, but she's a doctor, reading the chapter on Voltaire at breakfast time. And she said, Daddy, this is actually readable. It's the kind of thing children say. Um, um, so um, we do learn from history. And whether we learn the right things or the wrong things is, of course, a $64,000 question. There ought to be a modern version of the $64,000 question. Um, um, but to be entertained is to be instructed at the same time. If I see 40 towers, um, I'm being instructed, even as I belly laugh. Um, it was based on an actual hotel, uh, hotelier um, in, in the southwest of England. But I'm therefore on my watch at any new hotel as to whether I'm going to meet, meet a, a Basil Fawlty. So don't denigrate entertainment. It's a great way of learning. Um, who get to tell it is really important. It's a cliche that um, history is written by the winners. Um, there's a large slice of truth in that, but Herodotus was, as I say, an outsider. Thucydides was a loser. Clarendon, um, who wrote about the English Civil War, was on the losing side. Um, and I, there are all kinds of examples of people who maybe had to run for their lives, ended up by being the main chroniclers of their times. Um, I was, there's a, a chapter on the Islam world and its historians, um, which I felt I could cover, but I didn't cover um, a number of countries, some like a whole of Africa, um, because until certainly our lifetime, lifetimes, um, there is no historian of Africa who has really had a hugely influential, influential reputation. Um, if any of you are historians of Africa amongst you, I expect you to argue that. But, we, um, but I didn't cover China because for centuries history was written by um, scribes in Chinese courts who knew exactly what they could and couldn't write about. And they were chroniclers. They didn't use um, private judgments because they knew it was too dangerous. Um, actually, uh, at certain times, they kept notebooks, private notebooks, which have been discovered since. But as people who, in any considered way, presented history for the masses, um, they, they put down very selective facts and then when you come into Mao and the Chinese Revolution, the same restrictions apply um, in, in a similar way. So there, who can tell, who can tell that story um, is limited by the political powers that be. Um, and that's a fact for any number of societies. Um, and we're lucky living in a country where you can be rude to power not totally, but with far greater freedom, freedom than probably getting on for half the world. Could you comment on the notion of a professional historian? What is a professional historian as opposed to entertainers and fabulous like Shakespeare, Virgil, Homer? What is meant by this modern concept? Of a professional historian? A professional historian who gets paid for it by either the government or an educational body. I mean, you could say, um, I'm making my profession that of being a professional historian. And therefore, you can be outside the academy. But I'm sticking, my truth is the one I've just given you. Yes? You're going to have to speak up. Because even I'm wearing hearing aids, I'm so ancient. Um, recently in the news, there have been reports that our uh, U.S. 
officer training schools have whitewashed history? Is that something that occurs routinely in, their, in military uh, institutions? In military institutions? Well, all those who govern sources of history writing have, guess what, their own agenda. And that varies in flexibility um, from decade to decade, fashions to fashions. Um, and the military is sometimes, uh, maybe regretting it thereafter, uh, being fairly free with what they allow people to write. Um, but at other times, um, they protected the truth. I mean, to take one example, um, the um, monument in Washington to the Vietnam War um, describes my lay um, in terms which the government, when it was erected, felt were reasonable and safe. And it was only when there was a real outcry when the monument was um, revealed that they had then to rewrite that description and make it a more complete one. So um, it, it's a variable C. So I'm not a spokesman about the past now, I'm a spokesman about the future. that everyone in this audience has got to be a rebel because it's crucial to understand the past with at least a decent modicum of truth um, that we fight against power because we know from history that those in power will shape the past and indeed shape the present to ways that suit themselves. And therefore, looking into um, the immediate future we know that um, there's all, you know, come January, there are all kinds of battles um, between um, the Republicans and the Democrats for an immediate sense of what the last few years has been. Um, and um, I can't put it more simply than to say that go through the world, go through what's happening in Indonesia, go through what's happening in Cuba, wherever you might choose, but what's happening in Islam, where history is thought of. It, historians used to be thought of um, as one rank below prostitutes. Um, that we have a fight on our hands to fight for truth, which means truth of what has happened in our past and the relevance of it, the meaning of it, what we can learn from it. Um, I, I do sound like a, a, somebody thumping, but it seems to me absolutely obvious that we've got to fight on our hands. Yes? So as we live, thank you, brother. As we live through this period where there's so much reassessment of the past and questioning of things that we all used to hold to be true, or many of us do, one thing, particularly when it comes to things that are not books, we hear all the time, is they're taking away our history, they're erasing our history. As one of those professional historians, I have a response to that. But I'm curious what your response to this sort of double-sided devotion to history that, that we hear so much about, sort of the, this resentment for any type of reassessment I'm not quite sure what the question is, so I can absolutely turn it to my agenda. Um, one of the things about history is 
a lot of people come after not only the event itself, but follow on from partial or wrongful versions of history. So when William of Malmesbury wrote about the history of England and created King Arthur and Lancelot, Guinevere, and the rest, um, he wasn't even Welsh, um, let alone that didn't come from Monmouth. Um, there were people after him who could put matters to rights. And so um, our understanding of history is like a palimpsest of different views, putting one way and then the next, and correct, correcting moments or periods of the past the whole time. And that, um, one hopes, is a, a constant and will continue this correcting ability of different cultures at different times um, to make healthier um, the way we look, at, we look at what has happened in the past. Um, I, um, when I was working in publishing, um, was lucky enough to be the editor of John Keegan, whose book, um, The Face of Battle, really transformed um, the way that military history was written. But John, when he was 11, 12, um, contracted TB, a debilitating disease, and he spent his teenage years in a hospital, very often with ordinary um, troopers, soldiers from the Second World War, who befriended um, young Johnny, um, educated him, told him stories, and he learned to have a tremendous respect for the serving, the fighting man. And when he came out of, um, well, when TB got a cure, um, and although he went through life with a back that became worse and worse as years went by, he volunteered for national service and was just laughed out of court by the doctors who were examining him. Um, but what he took to the writing of military history was both a kind of moral zeal, not in any pompous sense, but in a courageous um, and enlightening, emboldening sense um, about what war is and the horrors of war, what it's like to fight in a war, um, which was part of the revolution that he um, caused to happen in the way it was written about. Um, but he also, because of his own position, unable to fight in a war, and as Samuel Johnson said, we all of us who have never fought in the war have a particular kind of envy of those who have. Um, he had a romance, a romantic view of the fighting man that post John, John Keegan's writing, has been corrected by people who may not be as great historians as he, but can, you know, again, write the ship of history as it were. Well, history is curious that history is a historical sequence, and that the circulation in English until the 19th century. Um, um, the um, business of history or histories, um, you know, they're both labels, whichever you want to use. Um, I was going, my own view, I was going to say something extremely profound, but now I'd have to make it up and convince you it was the truth. Um, <laughs> And it's fled from my mind. Um, I think that generally, um, 
Beware of anything that says it's the last word on any aspect of the past. Um, that doesn't stop the fact that, that I mean, um, you know, I constantly thought, if I had to say which of the five best works of history, for me personally, um, there's one wonderful um, history by an American on the Spanish Armada. I think it's called the Spanish Armada, published long ago, it was 1959. And one of the things it does is, for instance, it talks about what it was like to operate a cannon and the carry of a cannon and the likelihood of hitting anybody um, and um, the likelihood of it exploding in your face. And if you like, it was a, a kind of Keganism before Keegan. You really felt the texture of daily life for a soldier responsible for firing this machine of death. What I was actually going to say, my brilliance now comes back to me, um, was the hotel we're staying at is immediately opposite um, the museum for the story of the American uh, War of Independence. And if you look at the brochure, the advertisement for the museum, we're going tomorrow morning, so I can't say I've been, it says, forget all the history you've been taught in the past, in primary school or whatever, this museum really tells you as it, or as it was. <laughs> well, by lunchtime tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so that's my answer. At the back. Yeah, so you mentioned you know, a historian who writes about war but has never been in war, right? You know, I'm in no way qualified to write something about engineering. Are we supposed to take historians more objective if they have never actually been on whatever field or industry they're reporting on? Or wouldn't that actually be a knock on their credibility? that they don't have that intimate knowledge, right? So you mentioned even, you know, the American who's writing about Mexico and Peru. What, you know, aside from research, what gives them that intimate knowledge of a culture or a country that they maybe never lived in or are not affiliated with? It's a great question, or about which I could expound to send you all to sleep in many, many, many minutes. <laughs> um, 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 the short answer is the brilliance of the creative mind. Um, but beyond that, um, in the introduction to the first volume of his diaries, Henry Kissinger says there's one thing that a person writing about their own time in history gives. They were actually there. And that gives them, um, you can still write spuriously, um, that gives them a certain kind of authority that someone who wasn't cannot possess. But then you've got um, uh, Avril Hahnemann, who wrote President of the Creation, an ironic, ironic title, um, given what I'm going to tell you. Um, he sent uh, one account, one part of his memoirs, um, to a friend, said, look, this is such an important conversation about government policy and what we're going to do and for and against various strategies. Um, can you tell me whether I remembered it? I mean, I tried to say that, you know, um, when I witnessed so and so and so and so giving their point of view that I'm correct. And his friend wrote back and said, oh, you've got it absolutely right and it's an extraordinarily good depiction with one exception. You weren't actually present. <laughs> um, and you've got examples throughout history of people who were there getting it wrong. Um, a, a Russian um, was asked by um, a British officer what Napoleon was like. The kind of Russian, great white beard, and, you know, been there during Napoleon's invasion of his country. And he said, Oh, Napoleon, yes, a great tall man, but beard as long as mine. <laughs> um, and you know, even crucial things like the, the um, records at um, the Holocaust Museum. Um, um, in, in Jerusalem, um, they've had to discount quite a number of oral histories which were given them in good faith of people thinking they really were telling the truth about the experience they were relating and were later shown to be highly inaccurate. So even people who go through things, though they should have and can have a special authority, 
have the ability to get things wrong too. earlier, um, one of the chapters in my book is about a group of French historians called the Annala School, and they operated from 1920s to late 1960s, and they revolutionized the writing of history. Now you may say, oh, hold on, you said Shakespeare revolutionized writing of history and bore him a lot. Yes, we've had a number of revolutions of history, as we've had other kinds of revolutions in our lives generally. But what the Annal School did um, was they brought into writing of history um, geography, sociology, economics, um, a whole range of other disciplines. It's not for nothing that von Renke used the word discipline um, as being crucial to academic pursuits, and particularly the profession of being a historian, because he thought, you know, discipline, good Prussian army word, shows we were more honourable in our pursuits. Um, that um, the discipline should encompass as many of these sub-subjects or co-subjects as possible in order to get a more complete truth. He also, by the way, um, the Annals School included one of my favourite historians, Frederick Brudel, who talked about um, uh, the long period, the long time. And he said, Let's, we may want to write about particular battles or particular episodes of a country or nation or world's history, but it makes far more sense, and to get at greater truths, to think of vast, vastly longer periods of time. The erosion of mountains, the changing of seas, um, things which happen over millennia, not a year, a decade, or whatever it might be. And again, that's to get at a more complete truth. So it's not only the historians who approach history with an agenda, it's also those of us who read it. And, you know, we don't, I, I, you know, not someone who is reading it for purposes of writing history, but because I'm interested. Obviously, I can only read so many books on a topic. I can't read 15 books on the Russian Revolution. So I have to pick and choose. How, how do we as a reader assess what we're reading, especially if something is very, very well written. You read something by a, a, you know, a historian, as you say, entertaining, and it, it, you know, it captures you, you read it, you're really involved in it, but you know, most of us don't have a basis to make an assessment as to whether or not you know, what's being written is you know, how accurate it is, or to what extent, more likely to what extent their agenda is you know, leading them to pick and choose in terms of the, of the history that they're relating. My answer to that is bad luck. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, you know, um, uh, making history. Obviously, you look up Amazon and read all the reviews of the book and make up your mind. Um, it, it, there's no, um, as Humpty Dumpty said, there's no knockdown argument on that. You've got to do the best you can within the time available, with your range of friends that you have, and, and so on. Um, it's not a very satisfactory answer, but we can't read everything. Um, and you just do, you do what you can. But then, remember, you're all historians. When you get back home, um, you say to whoever you're living with, you'll never, you'll never guess I ran into Lady Gaga on the street today. She loves Philadelphia. Um, Whatever it is, you start telling a story. You tell your story, a piece of history that you select and you shape um, according, it may seem inspirational or intuitive or whatever, but that's your contribution to history. And the person you're talking to may say, uh, you're pulling my leg again, or why are you such a, um, an inaccurate um, recaller of what you've been up to? 
So most of our lives we're confronted by people telling us stories about the past that we have to decide whether or how much truth is in them. It's a hard life. <laughs> something good to read and Richard will be right back there to sign the copies and to converse with you. Thank you for being here this evening.